It's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. You call me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. You call me It's amazing, it's amazing, I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God, you call me friend, I am a friend of God. Good morning, Resurrection. Happy Sunday. We're glad to be with you this day via live stream or Facebook Live and, and hope that you bring all of us with you into your home, into your space. Today, we continue our Easter series. We started with the uh, cross and then we went to the tomb. Today, we go to the room and next week, we go to the road. We invite you this day to envision yourself with the disciples in the space the week after Jesus was uh, crucified. Uh, Reverend Vicki brings us the word today, and I'm excited to hear what she has to say to us this morning. Easter is a big season for resurrection. It's our name. 
we celebrate Easter and our anniversary together. We're going to be 48 years old at the end of this month, and we invite you to participate as you can in our 48-year anniversary offering, our Easter anniversary offering, uh, to celebrate who we are at resurrection and who we will continue to be. Wherever you are this day, you are resurrection. Your home is one of our many campuses. You are in the space you need to be. So as you join us this day, celebrate Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, knowing that we are with you there and celebrate even in this room that we will return to God's love for all of us. This morning's reading is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, 
and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven then. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Our contemporary reading today is from Reverend Dr. James Cone's book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. To live meaningfully, we must see light beyond the darkness. As Marcia Eliade put it, life is not possible without an opening toward the transcendent. The lynching era, era was the heart of darkness for the African-American community. The Christian gospel is God's message of liberation in an unredeemed and tortured world. As such, it is a transcendent reality that lifts our spirits to a world far removed from the suffering of this one. And yet, the Christian gospel is more than a transcendent reality, more than going to heaven when I die to shout salvation as I fly. It is also an imminent reality, a powerful liberating presence among the poor right now in their midst, building them up where they are torn down and propping them up on every leaning side. The gospel is found wherever poor people struggle for justice, fighting for their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Amen.
Our lives exist in and are known through and are defined by broken relationships. Jesus's wasn't any different. Imagine being in that room is still the first Easter. Some of the disciples are gathered together in that same room where there had been some 50 plus people just a few nights ago. As they broke bread and shared the cup. Each disciple, including Mary of Magdala, Mary the mother of James and Salome, they had their families with them. Of course, Martha had brought her small group and they had made the preparations for this time together. Mary brought her brother Lazarus. Jesus' mother and siblings were also there. There was much laughter and joking and more food that they could eat in one sitting. Peter and Jesus had a disagreement, as was their norm. Judas left early. Jesus, the consummate host, washed everyone's feet. And all through 
the meal. Jesus kept reminding them to remember his ministry, remember his mission, remember his relationship to and with them, to remember this meal, to remember this night, to remember him. Several had chided Jesus about being so morbid and talking about death. Jesus said, maybe. Yet he warned them that they would deny him, betray him, leave him alone. All had assured him that in no way would they ever leave him or forsake him. But here we are, three days later, and everybody has scattered just as he said they would. The disciples thought that it was better if they split up no more than 10 together in any one place. Some stayed in Jerusalem, others in Bethany. A few headed to Galilee and there were some heading to Emmaus, all remembering what he said, all remembering what they had done or not done for their friend, their rabbi, their Lord. It all happened so fast after that meal. Jesus praying in the garden, the betrayal, the arrest, the denial, the trials and the convictions, the beatings, the thorns, the abandonment, the lynching, his death and his burial, all a blur. It still seemed surreal. And now the, the women are saying that they had seen Jesus alive. Jerusalem was electric. Folks were whispering about Jesus' body missing from the tomb, wondering who stole it, wondering if he were alive. There were troops everywhere, stopping everyone. You could hear the clinking of their armor and dragging of their spears on the ground. You could hear them shouting commands, stop, put your hands on the wall. Religious scribes and Pharisees were walking hurriedly in small groups, whispering and wondering what to do now, afraid of the Roman occupiers and what they might do to them. The Sanhedrin was in session behind closed doors. They were interrogating Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus about this insurrectionist from Nazareth and their relationship to him. Some of the disciples in the room were crying. Others were lost in thought, wondering who could have taken the body. Others wondering, was he truly alive? Were the women telling the truth? All reflecting on how they had failed Jesus and how they had broken their relationship with him. All were thinking about how their actions and their inactions had wounded Jesus, the one who had made a new covenant with them in this very room just a few days ago. The one who had shown them nothing but love. So it's not surprising that they didn't hear him come in. He went unnoticed until he was standing in their midst. And Jesus says to them, Shalom Aleichem, peace unto you. You know what we miss in this exchange is 21st 
century Christians is that Jesus is extending to these disciples, these individuals who had abandoned him in his moment of greatest need. He was offering them an opportunity of reconciliation for their broken relationships. He was offering them forgiveness. You see, it was the Jewish custom and understanding at that time that when two people met, there's a communal interaction that happens between them. So there is a need to establish peace and to create unity in that moment. So Jesus saying, peace unto you, is his request for peace and unity between the disciples who were present in the room and himself. Jesus is saying, in essence, I'm ready to reconcile with you. I'm ready to forgive you for all the ways you have broken relationship with me. Jesus knows their feelings of guilt and shame, and he wants to heal their relationship. So he extends the blessing and requests, Shalom Aleichem, peace be unto you. And Jesus shows him his scars. Because wounds upon bodies come from particular experiences. It wasn't about making them feel more guilt or shame. He was being vulnerable with them. You see, we, we can't erase a wound's particularity if we in truly intend to authentically open ourselves to the life of another. Jesus was sharing his truth, acknowledging that he had been wounded not only by his journey to the cross, but by their actions and inactions. And in sharing this truth, he was also saying he still wanted to be in relationship with them. Not just any kind of relationship, but right relationship with them. Jesus' invitation to those present now and to Thomas later in this room is a vulnerable offering appropriately shared only with those closest to him, not with all who believe that they have the right to see his scars. Jesus was modeling for them and for us that Resurrection isn't a single moment. Resurrection is a relationship. And, and authentic relationships can and do cause wounding and scars, yet they can be transformative if we are willing to offer our truth in them. Because authentic relationships ask of us vulnerability, the willingness to put all of ourselves on the line. You see, the wounds on his hands, the wound on his side, the one that Thomas later touches, these are not just any wounds. They are the wounds of a man who was crucified by the state because of his commitment to love and his confrontation with oppressive powers. And they were also the wounds of a man who was abandoned by his closest friends because of fear. Yet he was standing here showing his wounds because these wounds represented hope for a different kind of future. They were the promise of a relationship that not even death could bring to an end. Perhaps the disciples finally understood through seeing his wounds and hearing his offer of shalom, peace, and unity that Jesus was extending to them and to us the surety of a relationship that will never be broken, no matter how badly we attempt to break it. 
that will never be abandoned even when we walk away from it. He was talking about a relationship that would be forever. Think about it. How much a relationship like that, one built on vulnerability, on love and forgiveness, one built on the healthy commitment of doing what it takes to sustain it, one that seeks unity, harmony, and peace, one that will never end. Think about what that would mean to them in this moment, in this room. Heck, think about what it would mean to us. Allowing them to see his wounds is a deeply relational move. And it is a request, an offering, a mutual invitation. An invitation to remember. An invitation into relationship not only with him, but with all of creation, an invitation to experience resurrection, an invitation and to a call to complete the ministry he left into their care. Jesus' ministry was one of moving towards the wounds of others with compassion and solidarity in this very room. Jesus draws the disciples towards his own wounds. I wonder if he was thinking, will they rise even in their fear to continue the movement of love that I had begun? Would they respond to my wounds with compassion and restored solidarity? Jesus offers us that very same greeting today. He offers us resurrection, an intimate, authentic relationship, wounds and all. Shalom, alechem, peace be unto you. And like the disciples who were in that room, we get to choose how we respond. A rabbi acquaintance of mine explained to me that there were two stages in this peacemaking that Jesus begins in that room. The first stage is where the initial person, in this case Jesus, states that they are ready to request unity, peace, harmony, and right relationship between the two parties. And you do so, he said, by saying, Shalom Alechem, peace unto you. Then the second person needs to respond that they are in agreement and also want unity and peace and right relationship. And they would do this by responding, Alechem Shalom, unto you peace also. You see, the second person is the actual entity who establishes the right relationship, who establishes the peace between the two parties. The disciples get to choose. We get to choose. Peace or no peace. Unity or no unity. Relationship or no relationship. We get to choose. If we accept and uphold the covenant of Jesus that he so graciously extends to us, we get to choose if we are willing to receive resurrection anew. We get to choose if we will live into our calling as followers of Christ to tend wounds with compassion and solidarity. And know this to be true, that if we say yes, we will encounter the wounds of others who have survived difficult experiences 
like this pandemic we are weathering right now, like the loss of a loved one, or sexual violence, or experiences of war, or everyday racism, or any of a plethora of other crucifying forces. And no, we will be afraid for our own safety. Just like the disciples huddled together in that room some 2,000 years ago, or how we are together apart today. Yet in this moment, will we muster the courage to remain true to Jesus' command to love with compassion and solidarity in frightening times? Yes, our lives are a collection of broken relationships, and we have the scars to prove it. The question for us is, will we allow ourselves to be solely defined by these scars, or will we be courageous enough to go into the rooms in which we have been wounded, or the ones in which we have done the wounding, and speak shalom, peace? I know without doubt, Jesus says to us today, Shalom Alekum. What will we choose? To remain in our woundedness of, and fear or accept the opportunity into a path towards healing and wholeness and compassion and solidarity? My prayer, my hope for us is that we will have the courage to respond individually and collectively as a community of faith with Alekam Shalom. And to you also, peace. Praise be the nurses and doctors, every medical staff bent over flesh to offer care, for lives saved and lives lost, for showing up either way. Praise for the farmers tilling soil, planting seeds so food can grow, an act of hope if ever there was. Praise be the janitors and garbage collectors, the grocery store clerks and the truck drivers barreling through long, quiet nights. Give thanks for bus drivers, delivery persons, postal workers, and all those keeping an eye on water, gas, and electricity. Blessings on our leaders making hard choices for the common good, offering words of assurance. Celebrate the scientists working a way to understand the thing that plagues us to find an antidote, and all the medicine makers. Praise be the journalists keeping us informed. Praise be the teachers, finding new ways to educate children from afar and blessings on parents holding it together for them. Blessed are the elderly and those with weakened immune systems, all those who worry for their health. Praise for those who stay at home to protect them. Blessed are the domestic violence victims on lockdown with abusers, the homeless and refugees. Praise for the artists and poets, the singers and storytellers, all those who nourish with words and sound and color. Blessed are the ministers and therapists of every kind, bringing words of comfort. Blessed are the ones whose jobs are lost, who have no savings, who feel fear of the unknown nine. Blessed are those in grief, especially who mourn alone. Blessed are those who have passed into the great night. Praise for police and firefighters, paramedics, and all who work to keep us safe. Praise for all the workers and caregivers of every kind. 
praise for the sound of notifications, messages from friends reaching across the distance. Give thanks for laughter and kindness. Praise be our four-footed companions with no forethought or anxiety, responding only in love. Praise for the seas and rivers, forests and stones who teach us to endure. Give thanks for your ancestors, for the wars and plagues they endured and survived. Their resilience is in your bones and your blood. Blessed is the water that flows over our hands and the soap that helps keep them clean each time a baptism. Praise every moment of stillness and silence so new voices can be heard. Praise the chance and slowness. Praise be the birds who continue to sing the sky awake each day. Praise for the primrose poking yellow petals from dark earth. Blessed is the air clearing overhead so one day we can breathe deeply again. And when this has passed, may we say that love spread more quickly than any virus ever could. May we say this was not just an ending, but also a place to begin. Like the disciples still reeling from the painful events around them, we do not know with certainty what lies ahead. But we do know this, God remains with us. We remain a community. The witnesses of the saints remains to guide us. In the assurance that these provisions of God will sustain us, let us share what we have and give generously to the work of love.
Spirit of God, come. Breathe afresh on your people. Let courage be renewed and the hope for justice revived. As crucifixions continue among us, as white supremacy, classism, and cruelty persist, may these and all our offerings be added to the labors of liberation. Let all that devalues and destroys life crumble and grant us the desire to build your world anew. Amen. Your Easter people gather to praise you, amazing God. Continue to make your ways known to us. Fill us with your presence. We cannot live without you. Your counsel and instruction are with us day and night. We have only to open ourselves to your direction. On the night Jesus was handed over to suffering and death, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, Holy One, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and all those who were present there with him. And he said, take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks. He gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new and everlasting covenant. My love, which is offered to you as a sign of your belovedness. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray. As we receive these gifts in remembrance of you, the Christ, may they remind us of the healing and wholeness we find in you. Amen. Amen. At Resurrection MCC, as at MCCs around the world, we offer an open table, which means that you need not be a member of this congregation or any congregation to receive these gifts that are freely given by a generous God. The table is prepared. Let us now taste and receive the goodness of God. The body of Christ. Let us pray. Inspire in us fullness of joy, we pray, as we respond in faith to the risen Christ and embrace the task you set before us. Build up our sense of community that we may truly care for one another, especially through all of life's trials. Amen. Amen. As I prepared for today, a song from the musical Hamilton kept playing in my head in the room where it happened. You see, the character Aaron Burr sings about his desire to be in the room where decisions are made, where lives are changed, where the courses of nations happen. I believe that that room that Jesus entered 2,000 plus years ago was such a room. Scripture doesn't record the disciples' response, yet we are here. So at least some of them said, yes, alekum swam, and to you peace. Today we can choose to change a life, even if it is our own, by extending shalom, peace. Even in isolation, we can begin to heal the world. Shalom Aleichem.